So good afternoon and welcome to our event dedicated to best practices in board governance. It's our first event around that topic with lots of independent directors. Just for your information, we will start from next week on, on Monday, our dedicated club to independent directors and would certainly be very happy to count on you uh, in order to start those discussions and uh, chip in with lots of interesting, let's say, perspectives and observations. Also, thanks a lot to uh, Adrian and the Aaron team for hosting us today. Thanks to Edward for organizing the, this great event and also to the LPA team. It's really a nice success to see you everywhere. I mean, from everywhere here today in Luxembourg and also here in Kirchberg. So what we wanted to do with this event, it was really, first of all, to stress out the importance of independent directors. I mean, they have played and are playing an important role here in our substance and also ecosystem. It's also very interesting to have them on board because of the independence, the expertise they are bringing and certainly the diversity. Different profiles coming from all over the world or from Luxembourg joining and evolving because if you remember well when we introduced the AFMD in 2013 afterwards many of such directors came more from the liquid space and then asked us how can we get such mandates and that was really the one, um, the one million question in order to get them ready for such mandates, if you have no prior exposure to that. So it was not that easy, but they would also like to stress out the great role that ELA has played in order then to train all those independent directors, to prepare them for the challenges, to propose some different pathways, and also to integrate alternative, let's say, asset classes like ours and strategies. That's exactly what we want to push further, hand in hand with you and, and the others. And today's conference is really dedicated to, let's uh, check, for example, the shared views of the asset managers and fund managers. It's really to see what are they doing, what are they looking at. And so, uh, for example, the benefits of hiring, let's say, independent directors is also very important. We like, for example, also to stress out the challenges such directors have. So it's not just now getting a diploma or, uh, let's say, an... an an, a document which is signed and then you're good. You need to constantly evolve. You, you need to look at the trends that are out on the market. You need to also, let's say, gain more experience and then, uh, let's say, discuss with all those new managers which strategies you could also work in the future. Uh, another one is also how to smoothen that relationship between the initiators of those funds, those GPs and those directors. And finally, another important one is how do you select such players? on which criteria, which basis, where are you looking at? And so uh, that's why we wanted first to introduce you to uh, Karen O'Sullivan. She is the head of CSSF's innovation, payments, market infrastructures, and also government's department, and would like to hear more about the, let's say, regulatory view and the environment. So good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for having me today at your, your first event. So as being the first speaker, it's always difficult, and I think being the first speaker at any event and being the regulator is even more difficult. But what I'm going to try and do, at least for the next 10 minutes or so, is give you a little bit um, or a few insights into, into the regulator's approach, the regulator's view about governance, board governance, why it's important, why we look at it, or what aspects of it that we, we pay attention to or we look at. Before, afterwards, I'll hand you over to the panel who are involved in these kind of discussions on, on a day-to-day -day basis, so we'll be, have a lot more practical experience and information to share with you. So if we jump straight into the heart of the subject and say, well, what is board governance and why is it important? Why, did, why do we care about it? I think board governance is really the, the act of, of governing a company. It's taking the decisions, it's the administrative centre, the administrative control, if you like, over the running of a company, um, any company, be it in the financial sector or, or elsewhere. And the board of directors is really the organ who's responsible for, for guiding those decision making. It's the board of directors then who has the responsibility or is accountable to the different stakeholders, be it the internal employees, management, be it the external uh, clients, be it shareholders or any other stakeholders. And the board is supposed to work in a way um, that they're, they're independent of the different stakeholders and, and are fair and kind of look after the, the proper treatment of all those different stakeholders. So if the governance is the overall, we'd say, act of, of governing or managing, organizing an entity, What's the board of directors role? Well, the board of directors ultimately have full responsibility for, for the running of a company. They, um, 
They're, they're responsible for setting the, the, the overall strategy. They're defining the, the company vision, the values, and protecting the, the long-term prosperity of the, of the entity. So it seems, when you look at it like that, a very, very important and, and daunting task, and it covers a lot of aspects. And the board then, in order to fulfill that, that overall responsibility um, over the, the proper control and management of the company, they need to set different strategies, they need to set internal guidelines or guiding principles. And then, if you like, the strategies and the guiding principles need to be taken over by management to be implemented so that ultimately the company on a day-to-day -day basis is run in order to meet those strategies or those goals or, or visions or whatever that have been set. So the board of directors has a very key role to play in setting those strategies, determining the business, uh, say the business strategy, the business, business model of the company, and then to a certain extent deciding well, what strategy do we need to put in place, for instance, over things like risk management, over in, in IT systems, over uh, maybe investment policies, over succession planning, diversity, so really, or the internal controls, overall internal controls. So really, the board is looking at the different um, aspects or topics in the operations that will feed up into the strategy. And again, they have to develop or put in place the strategies in, in the attempt, we'll say, that the company is run the way it should be in line with the overall view or, or mission statement. And then as the actual implementation of those strategies or, or principles are assumed by the daily management, the board has a key role to play in the oversight of how that management take those strategies and, and convert it, if you like, into internal policies and procedures, making sure that ultimately what's put in place in those policies and procedures is efficient, is effective, and then is, is, is meeting the, the strategy that was being picked or, or put in place. And then on a regular basis, say annually or whatever, needs to review those different strategy documents, needs to review the internal controls, perhaps the risk management, making sure that it's still fit for purpose, it's still up to date and still compliant with the, the overall say, market uh, requirements, uh, depending on, on the sector, or depending on the type of vehicle we're talking about. So really, Governance is how the overall company is being run, and the board is first and foremost in line to make sure that the company is run and functioning the way it should, so achieving its objectives, but all the while being compliant with the re regulatory requirements that are in place. So that's governance and the role of the board, but why for us as a regulator is it a concern? Why, why do we spend so much time looking at governance and, and checking how companies are being run? And I think here, governance and really good governance, it's a state of mind. I mean, you have a board of directors who's going to be overall running the company or responsible for running the company, which is a group of individuals. So the, the concern, if you like, around governance and why we, we have so many, many efforts and, and tasks that we undertake is that you're, you're giving the running of a company into a, a group of individuals. So it's, it's their behavior, it's how they're putting things into place, it's how they're taking the rules perhaps and converting it into practical day-to-day -day steps. So that's really why we're looking at it because in order, so one of our missions at least is to, to ensure the overall financial stability of the financial sector. So if we need to ensure the financial stability of the financial sector, we need to make sure that the different companies that are active in the financial sector are being properly run, properly governed in line with the rules. So then that feeds into the, the stability of the market. So that's really the overall um, kind of concern, if you like, or the reason that we look at uh, governance. How we do it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult um, kind of balance to find because, as we said, it's dependent on individuals. It's dependent on individuals reading rules, reading requirements, understanding them, and being, you know, proper, good, upstanding citizens and putting it into place in the in the day-to-day -day operations. So it's very hard to find the right balance between rules, hard and fast rules, and principle-based rules. Generally speaking, Luxembourg, we do as far as possible favour more of a principle-based approach, whereby we look at the different rules and the requirements and say, well, what, what are they trying to achieve? What's the spirit of the, the requirement? And we try to, to formulate it in a, in a principle-type approach, whereby the, the advantage, if you like, of doing it that way is that then the individual companies or, or board members or independent members can take those rules or requirements, take those principles and say, okay, how can I properly adapt them or best adapt them to the company or the, the vehicle that I'm sitting on the board of? So how can I take that principle and really 
translated or converted into, into say, baby steps that make sense for the vehicle, for the company that I'm in charge of. So by having principles, it gives that flexibility and it enables um, the use of proportionality in applying the regulations or the requirements in, in those day-to-day -day operations. So that's the good side of having a principles-based approach. The downside is that not everybody is always willing to play by the rules, if you like. So by having margin for, for interpretation, by leaving things open for flexibility, proportionality. Um, sometimes we have people then who will be looking to, to really pull that as far as they can and to, we say, abuse it as much as they can to kind of circumvent some of the, uh, some of the, the rules that should be in place. So for us, it's the, the concern around our kind of oversight of the governance is really finding the right balance between where we can have principles and where we need hard and fast rules. And I think in that respect, if we look at the moment, what we have is, to a large extent, more principle-based uh, documents that we, we use and we, we enforce as we can. And I think one, one key document, which is really, we say, the Bible when it comes to, to good governance, particularly good governance in, in, in the financial sector, in the fund sector specifically, and it's the, the CSF Circular 18698, um, which is really we consider it the Bible. And it, it, it's long, it's 100 pages, so you could say, hmm, it's, 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 a, it's a big Bible, 100 pages long, lots of information. But it really contains very, very valuable information, perhaps insight, guidance into the requirements, and how we think entities can actually apply those, those principles in day-to-day in -day life. Okay, so it really is, it, it's, it's vast, it's very, very, very long, but it's a lot of valuable information and a lot of the answers to a lot of the questions that we have, we can find the answers by reading through the document, particularly when you're bearing in mind that it's, it's principle-based. So it's not, well, with a few exceptions, hard and fast rules, but it's really trying to get across the, the, the spirit of what we're trying to put in place or the spirit of what we would like to see in place. The, the, this circular, okay, it's specific to the fund industry, but it's it's very very similar to the document or the circulars that are applicable to the other industries. So again, the principles that we are trying to achieve and put in place are standard across the financial sector, which in a way makes sense because ultimately the goal behind the governance requirements is to make sure that the financial sector as a whole is 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 managed we say properly on a day-to-day -day basis so that's why the principles are the same now there might be some adaptations or interpretations of the the, the principles that would change one sector to the to the next but generally speaking it's the same rules that we would love to apply um, across the across the financial sector so I've said we have a circular 100 pages long, which seems quite a daunting task to pick up the circular and read and digest it. But um, we do have some good news, and not everything is doom and gloom. What we've noticed clearly over the last three years or so, or at least the last three years that I have the statistics from, um, is a clear progression in the level of compliance in governance matters. So we see that both in our off-site supervision, but more specifically in our on-site supervision. So the figures I have at least is that over the last three years, if we look at, say, the different uh, on-site inspections that were performed on the Superman Co's that have a more private equity type strategy. So there was three main uh, topics where weaknesses or, or, or kind of observations were raised. Those topics were AML. So I suppose it's not really too much of a surprise to say that there's weaknesses of some description around AML and the implementation of the respecting of all the different AML rules. And there it accounts for approximately 40 to 45% of the findings that we had over the last three years or so. Um, delegated activities is the same, it accounted for, again, approximately 40, 45% of the findings that we had. And governance um, and internal procedures accounted for approximately 15% of the findings. So that's positive in that there were findings, well, I suppose. It's, it's, it's very unusual to do an on-site inspection and have absolutely no findings at all. So having findings, it's normal. But I think it's, it's, it's a good message to say that we say only approximately 15% of those findings have been around governance and internal controls procedures. If we look to the AIFMs, again, having a, a P, a P um, strategy, the same three themes or the same three kind of areas of weaknesses were, were detected. The percentage is slightly different. So for AIFMs, we had, um, again, approximately 35 to 40% of the weaknesses were AML. 
Uh, governance and internal controls here was a little bit more, as closer to about 20%, and then delegated uh, activities for the AFMs was slightly less. So it's there, there were weaknesses, but I think generally we have certainly noticed um, a maturity, if you like, in the market um, and, and the, the, the compliance with the spirit, not just the rules, but really the spirit of the governance requirements that are in place. I think if we look to the root causes around the or behind the different um, weaknesses or observations that we had in, in those different um, on-site inspections, there was three main, um, kind of main root causes, if you like. So incomplete management information, lack of discussion of management information, and lack of review or approval of the, the investment firm manager's policies. Now, I'm not trying to uh, minimize the importance of those weaknesses that were there or the, the impact that it had um, on the running of the business, but I think it's, it's somewhat comforting that the weaknesses were more around, we'll say, the formalization, the documentation, really the account keeping, if you like, of the governance and the compliance with governance uh, requirements, rather than real breakdown in, in compliance with the, the, the spirit of governance itself. So there were weaknesses, there are things that need to be remediated, there's still work to be done, but I think it's, it's easier work to be done than if there was really a blatant non-compliance with the idea even of, of governance, okay? So I appreciate here we don't have all an only regulated vehicles, so how does that apply to, to, to non-regulated uh, vehicles? So here, I mean, if it's a non-regulated vehicle, obviously it doesn't fall under our direct supervision, so we don't have any immediate direct interaction or oversight over those, those vehicles. Having said that, a lot of them do have uh, registered management companies one way or the other, or different people in the, in the chain that do fall under our supervision. So for instance, when we are doing our on-site inspections, it covers the overall level of compliance and, and, and governance within the entity and doesn't necessarily make a distinction as to what the vehicle is behind. So in other words, if we're looking at a, a management company that has maybe regulated and unregulated funds, it's probably safe to assume that their overall internal control procedures, their overall functioning and mechanics of the, the board of directors, maybe the interaction of the board with management, whatever, it's applicable to all the vehicles that are under their management. So it's not direct um, inspection, if you like, over the unregulated entities, but it does give a certain assurance that, some, that the rules or the basis is being followed in that if it's been followed properly on one side, it's kind of safe to assume that for the other vehicles it's the same. So we don't have any, we'll say, uh, specific view on those vehicles, but I think it's generally the level of compliance, it's, it's, quite, it's quite reassuring. And I think there, if, if somebody asked me, did I have any recommendation or an advice to those type of vehicles, what I would say is, in the financial sector today, there is a lot of, of requirements, there's a lot of circulars or whatever around governance issues. Um, it's there for a reason, and I would re really recommend the, even the non-regulated vehicles to have a look at what's, inclu what's included in those documents and perhaps inspire themselves as best they can with those documents as to what kind of internal controls or mechanisms or arrangements that they would they themselves like to put in place. Okay. So maybe moving away from the, the governance and or the pure governance and, and our um, observations and, and findings over the last little while, and maybe to look more at the criteria that we would look for, that should be looked for when we're looking at, say, the suitability of an individual to, to assume a role as a, as a board member, be it independent, executive, non-executive. I don't intend to go through all the different uh, criteria that should be taken into account, but perhaps focus on some of those that would be the most, the most uh, important, perhaps, the most relevant um, for, for this evening. So I think first and foremost, it's, it's personal competence and, and experience. And I don't think it comes as any surprise that you'd say in order to accept a mandate, you need to have the competence and the experience that, that's required for that position. But what does that mean? Now, as you said in the beginning, the board of directors has a very important role in that they do have the ultimate responsibility for the overall running of the company. That does not mean, though, that every single board member needs to master completely every single aspect of the workings and the operations of the company. Because I think realistically, there's very few supermen or superwomen today who can honestly stand up and say, I can master every single aspect that's involved in the running of a company. So we don't need to master everything, but 
in a board, there's going to be several people and different board members are going to possibly have more or less responsibility for certain aspects. So any of the aspects that are under the direct, we say, responsibility, even though as a board it's still a joint responsibility, but any aspects of the operations, for instance, that would fall under the direct responsibility of one or other of the, the board members, when clearly the individual needs the competence, the experience, the knowledge to fully master that, that part and, and to accept the role. Okay? Even though you don't need to master all the aspects and be a, be a kind of an expert in everything. As a minimum, every single board member really needs to understand the structure of the, the vehicle, the entity that they're board member for, why it's there and why is it structured the way it's structured. And that is extremely important to have that overall understanding, regardless of your, your, your personal experience or, or competence. And really the, the reasons behind, particularly in some of the more complex uh, structures that you may see, to, to fully understand what are the reasons behind this structure, particularly when, when you've got different levels and, and, and different um, kind of groupings, whatever. Why is it structured like that? And again, wh what are the typically the, the tax reasons behind it? What are the tax impacts behind it? So those, those things you really have to have um, an understanding. And I think sometimes that's a difficult, particularly for independent directors, because if you're an executive director, so that means you're a, basically an employee somewhere within the group, you're an executive member, you have a working knowledge of the, the structure. You have a working knowledge of the different um, pieces within the organization and how they fit together. If you're an independent director, it's very difficult or more difficult at least to get that inside knowledge and inside understanding. But it's very, very important to have it. And it's the, the responsibility of the independent director to really ask the questions to make sure that they can get that understanding. And it's not sufficient to say, well, I don't know, I asked, nobody told me. You have to proactively look for that information and make sure that you have that understanding. Okay? Um, and, and I think the personal competence, so. Yes, there's historical competence, historical experience to, to, to be nominated in the first place. But I think today we're working in, an, in a rapidly changing or an ever-changing environment. So it's extremely important to make sure that the experience, understanding, knowledge is kept up to date. Okay, so things happen very quickly. I mean, again, not mastering everything, but at least understanding and keeping our experience and our knowledge up to date and following the market evolution. So that's on an individual level. On, a, on a, an overall board level, so there's the collective competence. So as I said, not everybody needs to master everything, but collectively, every aspect needs to be, ma to be mastered. So what I mean there is, for instance, we have a, a, P, a private equity vehicle. You have maybe the founders or the initiators behind the project. So they understand, maybe they have a good understanding of what investments they would like to have or what, what, what area they would like to, to, to work in. They know what the project is. Okay. They know, well, when I have my, invest, my, my, my investors and I have my, my money, I know where I want to invest it and I know how I want my project to run. But those individuals perhaps don't have a regulatory background. They may not fully understand or have a, a, a complete financial background. So they know, well, once I receive my investments, I know where I want to put it. But do they know how to actually manage and oversee the manage, management of the finances? Do they know how to, for instance, uh, review annual financial statements? Do they know what's needed in the regulatory reporting? Um, the, the, the compliance and the regulatory requirements that are in place. So that's why it's very important in those type of scenarios to have a mix of everything and make sure that really all the bases are, are covered. Another example, for instance, you could have a structure with a lot of, of the investments or some of the vehicles based outside Luxembourg, um, which is perfectly okay. There may be board directors coming from everywhere, from everywhere but it's possibly a good idea to have somebody local who is used to perhaps working with the CSSF, who's working, used to how things work in Luxembourg, and that adds a different experience and a different um, asset to the collective board. So when we're looking at the collective suitability, it's really making sure that all the different bases are appropriately covered, so be it the finance, be it IT, be it legal, be it regulatory. 
And then from our perspective, when we're looking at proposed uh, board compositions, we make sure before we approve those board of directors, again, oops, collectively, we make sure that all the different uh, aspects and all the different com competences are, are there and are covered. Again, the, the idea behind it is to ensure the, the overall smooth running of the company. And that's also something that needs to be taken into account when we're looking at uh, succession, succession planning. So again, as we're going forward and maybe either opening up a new position or replacing uh, an existing uh, board member, looking at well, what's missing. Is there, is there a key competence? Is there a key aspect that maybe we're not fully covering today or we could be covering differently? And then when you're looking at your succession planning, trying to fill in that gap as best as possible. Another interesting topic, and particularly when we're talking to independent directors, is the difference between independence and independence of mind. And it is very, very important. Independence, or an independent director, with a few exceptions, it's not a legal requirement. Okay, there's very few sectors or entities today where it's legally required to have an independent director. Having said that, when we're overseeing the financial market, um, our strong recommendation is to have an independent director because we can see and appreciate the advantages and the, what, what an independent director can bring to the table. So all members of the board do not need to be, and to a certain extent, realistically at least, cannot be independent of the company because independent really is independent of any kind of relationship which could cause a conflict of interest in, in the day-to-day -day business. So to have a board which is fully independent, it's rather unusual, and probably extremely difficult to obtain. Having said that, independence of mind is a behavioral aspect. And independence of mind is something that every single board member, executive, non-executive, independent, not independent, every single board member needs independence of mind. And what is independence of mind? It's basically the willingness, the ability, and to a certain extent, perhaps the courage to stand up and speak your mind, to go against things that you don't agree with. And that applies really for every single board member. Now, given that it's a behavioral aspect, it's the ability or the willingness to stand up and to speak your mind, it's very difficult for us to, we say, to, to check it. We can't look at somebody's CV, it's not written on your CV, I stand up and speak my mind. It's not in your declaration of honor. So it's very hard, based on, we say, documents, to, to for, you know, tick the box and say, yes, these people are independent of mind. It's really witnessed um, in the functioning of the board meetings. And that's why it's very important when you're either looking to, to nominate new members or looking to, to replace people or even on a, on a periodic basis looking to do a self-assessment of the performance of the board. It's something really that should be taken into a mind. When we look at independent directors, it's a little bit more complicated than that again because... I mean, in independent directors, it's, it's difficult. You're looking for mandates because that's how you earn a living. So you have your, your mandate, that's, that's your, 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 your revenue. There's something you don't agree with. You stand up and say, I don't agree, or you, you know, write a letter to the CSSF because there's something that's been done wrong in the company, which could mean, ultimately, that you lose your, your, you lose your mandate. So are you going to stand up and say, I don't agree? Are you going to draw attention to something that's incorrect or you don't believe it's in compliance with everything that it should be compliant with, with the risk of possibly losing your mandate or other mandates in the group or whatever? Or do you just keep quiet? That's independence of mind. And what you shouldn't forget is that if you don't stand up and express your opinion, well, implicitly, you've agreed with the decision that's been taken. So if, in a worst case scenario, and something goes wrong, or something is proven later to be uh, not in compliance with the regulations, by not standing up, not voicing your, your, your kind of adverse opinion, it's assumed you agree, so you're held fully accountable. So it's, 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 it's tricky, it's, it's behavioral, but it's extremely important and really should be taken um, or, or borne in, in mind um, both individually for yourselves, but also when you're looking at the functioning of the, uh, of the board. Time commitments as well, and I think that goes without saying, we need to have the appropriate, we need to be able to, to afford the time to do the job properly. 
Unfortunately, I think today the world is becoming more complex, it's becoming more tricky, there's more and more things that we need to focus on, that we need to be aware of, we need to keep up to, up to speed with. So it's necessary to some extent to limit the amount or the number of mandates that we may have in order to make sure that we can properly assume and discharge our responsibilities on those mandates that we do have. And it is difficult. Um, and, and even for us, we'll say as a, as a regulator, say, well, where do we put the cursor? Which is why in the circular uh, 18698, we, we've kind of given a limit, say roughly 20 mandates, or I think it's 1,900 and something hours. It's not, again, a hard and fast rule, or you'd say, well, if it's 1,922 hours, it's not okay, but 19 hours, it's okay. It's, it's a principle, it's a base, and it's really to, 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 to emphasize that you have to be able, not only in a business as usual scenario, but also in a crisis scenario, be able to really give and dedicate the time required to discharge the responsibilities of the board. Okay? Um, maybe the last, the last kind of thing to look at, and it's not suitability as such, but something to be borne in mind when we're looking overall at the, the, the composition of a board, is diversity. Diversity here is not kind of the, the, the normal diversity of men and women, it goes further than that. Obviously, men, women is it's the aspect of diversity today that is getting a lot of, a lot of press, um, and it needs to be taken into account, it needs to be considered. But going beyond that, it's also looking at, say, education, background, experience. So in a board, if you have a board of, for instance, five members who all have the same kind of um, professional kind of career and went from company type A to company type B to company type C and ended up on the board of directors, it's the same experience. You've got the same thinking, you've got the same kind of examples to, to fall back on. If you can have a diverse board with experience and background, well then that adds value it adds different views, different outlooks, different perspectives to the discussions around the board of directors. So it's important to look at diversity. And I think today I would, I would again recommend to, to have the courage to kind of embrace all the different aspects of diversity. I think when, again, ma ma man, woman is one of the aspects, but another thing that's receiving a lot of, a lot of press is everything around ESG. So the G in that is governance. Part of that governance is diversity. So if you're kind of saying, well, we're, we're looking at it and it's a key topic and it's very important because in today's world, more and more, we need to show that we're compliant with the, yeah, the principles and maybe to attract financing or investments or whatever. But part of it is governance and part of it is making sure then that you have that diverse board which ultimately benefits the, the running of the company. Okay? So I think... Going through that, some, some of my, my, my view or my, my uh, kind of impressions, if you like, of independent directors is probably uh, clear. So as I said, an independent director, no more than any other director, cannot master everything, is not expected to be an expert in everything. But um, they need, and which is the trickier bit compared to the, the executive members, for instance, they need to make sure that they have that understanding of the overall structure and the functioning of the structure. Um, having an independent director, it adds an outside eye to the board of directors. It, it can attract um, a, a different perspective, a different outlook. You can perhaps attract a, a broader set of, of competences or, or backgrounds. And with that, you're kind of arming the board as best you can to avoid as much as possible, at least the, the, the kind of the idea of groupthink and everybody going in the same way. So by having somebody outside the institution, outside the group, it kind of breaks away from that everybody is in the same mold and everybody moves together. And that can be very, very beneficial to, um, to a board and to ultimately the functioning of, a, uh, of, of an entity. And I think by having an, an independent person on the board, they're probably more able or in a better position to challenge some of the group decisions because they're not part of the group. So they have a different outlook on those decisions and maybe, again, a fresher look um, and possibly in some cases can, can challenge it a little bit better. And then by not being, again, part of the, part of the group or an employee of, in, in any level of the group, it means that the oversight of management, so part of the board's role, is to oversee the day-to-day -day activity and the day-to-day -day operations of the management. So by being outside the company, outside the group, it's easier then to oversee what those inside the group are doing. Because if you yourself are a board member and part of management, well, it's very difficult to objectively oversee what management is doing when you're, you're part of it. 
Um, so I think it's, it's the independent director is certainly a tough role. There's a lot of requirements, a lot of expectations, but it can be very, very beneficial to the organization and the, the running of, of a company. And then perhaps just to finish, um, kind of a look to the future, I think there's, as I said, there has been a lot of improvement over the last few years, a lot of maturity when it comes to how governance is translated into the internal operations and running of a company. So I think it's important for that to continue and to continue to embrace it and to continue to, to want to work in the spirit of what's there. So that's very positive. Some maybe a little more formal things that need to be re-emphasized and worked on, but I think generally to continue in the same um, progression that we see today and the same willingness to want to, to properly um, onboard some of those principles of governance. And I think in that respect, I mean, if something isn't broken, we're not going to fix it. So if we can see on our on-site inspections, if we can see as part of our off-site inspection, that generally speaking, things are in place and working the way they should, there's probably less likely, or at least there's less need for us to come out with more rules or laws or regulations. And it should enable us to continue with a more principle-based approach, which I think ultimately is in everybody's favor. So I think they were the, the main things I wanted to say today. So thank you. And I'll hand you over to the panel. So thank you so much for that very interesting insight. And uh, I can say it's uh, especially interesting for me for, for different reasons. Uh, also, or not least, because I also sit on a few boards myself, so it's very, very insightful, very helpful. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, in addition, thank you all for attending today, for, for coming. It's great to see such a huge turnout. Um, I know what this room looks like when there are very few people here. Uh, it's very depressing, so it's great to see so many faces in here. Um, and I think, you know, we had a great uh, start to the session, but we have an equally interesting uh, continuation for you scheduled today, uh, namely a panel discussion uh, with a very um, uh, prominent and, and esteemed panel that I would just maybe, you know, welcome to the stage at this point before I introduce them to you to the extent you don't already know them. So what we've tried to do is um, get a good mix of, of people here today to, to kind of give different ideas and different perspectives um, and make this as uh, interesting as possible for, for the participants and without being overly um, uh, optimistic or confident, I think we've, we've achieved that goal. So maybe without further ado, I'll just introduce the panel to you. Starting at the my far left, your far right, uh, we have Thomas Albert, who is a uh, who is CFO and co-CEO of Swiss Life Asset Managers Luxembourg, and also member of the board of various um, investment vehicles for Swiss Life Asset Managers uh, Luxembourg, but also for external funds. So thank you, Thomas, for being here today. Uh, next to Thomas, we have Anke Jager, who is an independent director uh, and has been a director on uh, numerous fund administration firms for the past 10, uh, 15 years, excuse me, um, and has expertise in various alternative asset classes, uh, but a particular focus on private equity and venture capital. In addition to that, uh, we know that you also have an AML compliance service uh, hat uh, and, and expertise that you bring to the table. Um, so welcome, Yago, as well, to, to the panel today. Next, we have uh, Jane, Jane Wilkinson, uh, who is an independent director, uh, also with a various uh, and, and broad and diversified experience, uh, both in private equity, but also mainstream usage. Uh, a specific focus also ESG, which we know is uh, near and dear to your heart. Previously, head of sustainable finance at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange and also audit partner um, for the alternative investment group at KPMG. So welcome, Jane. And last but not least, to my immediate left, we have Edward von Kimmel, uh, former CEO uh, and head of VP Fund Solutions within VP Bank Group, uh, also holding various uh, board mandates throughout the years, but since April 2021, full-time independent director and founder of ID LinkedIn, a corporate governance service provider, running independent director search, uh, the independent director search platform ID Ship, for those of you that, that don't know. 
So that is the panel we have for you today. Um, we've kind of, as I said, tried to get a diverse panel and try to uh, shed some light on different topics. And the first topic we'd want to get into and which I'll uh, seek Thomas's input on is kind of the view of an asset manager, what the investors are looking for. Um, and in that sense, what trends and, and requirements do you see on the investor side in terms of corporate governance, composition of board directors, and what are the drivers behind some of those requests that you see? Well, thanks um, for the intro. Very briefly, as a background, we have about 30 billion under management here, about 50 fund structures of how, which half is um, alternative investment. We are in a unique situation because uh, about 80% of the assets of the shareholders is coming from the insurance company itself. So obviously in the past, this independence was not that important for us. Uh, we said it's our assets, it's our management, we are in full control. Admittedly, that has changed over the last couple of years um, and we are looking for more and more independencies. Uh, we've started off on the Manco level um, and we've taken in independent director on that. Um, you mentioned in one of the pre-sessions you said, well, where do you take the independent directors from, from the old boys club? Um, we go for the winding and dining, they sign off and we've got peace in mind. Uh, that's not the way we see it. Uh, admittedly, I was, I was really happy to hear also Karen speaking. Um, some of these aspects we find very, very important. It's less driven from a shareholder perspective, but we see it from a governance perspective. So what we do is with the independent directors that we have on the board, and we don't have that many, admittedly, as independent or third-party mancos, but for, with those independent directors, we not only have the quarterly uh, board meetings, but I do have regular one-to-one -one sessions where we speak about the strategy of the company, where we, how we want to develop the company. Um, so for us, it is really important that we get the experience from the independent director. So I don't want someone sitting next to me telling me how great we are and uh, how easy it is and how super duper our governance structure is. I really want someone who can challenge me, but in a friendly way. So not in a board meeting where they're opposing every decision and asking for every uh, governance and every document, but more in a, in a partnership way, but challenging. And that's what we realized is, is very important to also bring the business forward and to avoid risk as well. Because we want to learn what's happening on the market. We want to gain from the experience because Karen, Karen mentioned it, obviously being an executive director, I feel we have everything under control. I know where the business is moving. We're growing every year 15%, so everything is fine and it's in order. But that's not the point. So we realize that even when we speak to our shareholders, they're looking more and more for the independency and we want to be challenged on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not just the quarterly meeting that you have, but it's a regular exchange of thought. We look for someone who has the experience in the market. We look for someone who brings the regulatory knowledge, but also the knowledge on similar entities who have similar challenges. What does ESG mean? How do we implement it? What do we do with diversity? How is it done in other companies? So this is what we're really looking for, and that's also when we speak to shareholders, and we're getting more and more third-party shareholders as well, large ones, especially large institutional ones. They really want to see that independence as well, that you have an open mindset, and that you're not just bound in your own business strategy, and you're happy with what you're doing and how you're developing. Thank you. No, indeed, I think that uh, what you said is that um, you know the investor expectations around what uh, what a good board should look like and what the roles are is, is certainly very interesting. But there's obviously also a different perspective in terms of uh, what the initiator wants to achieve, and, and you touched on some of those elements as well. But maybe I would hand it over uh, to Eduard as well to to give his view in terms of you know what is the right way to compose a board, to construct a board. What are really the the, the key features one would look for? Diversity, independence are all words we heard uh, earlier today. So, um, be interested in, in hearing your views on that as well. 
Yes, from, from, from a fund uh, initiator point of view, uh, Tom already answered some of these questions, but let me maybe answer in a historical, uh, from a historical point of view. If you look back 15, 20 years before, um, most time in, in fund boards, SPV boards, general partners, and mango boards, you could find only employees of the company. At this time, also quite often uh, from the headquarter. If you look back then, 15 years, they realized that they need somebody on the ground for different reasons, knowing the business, knowing the regulation, but also maybe to, to build up some substance. So this was the first move where they also hired local people. Still sometimes own employees, but they also started then to ask the service provider, can you some, offer somebody or their uh, legal advisor to, to provide them independent directorships or directors uh, in, in, in the vehicles here in Luxembourg. So they also realized, yes, this is already an added value, but there are still, still sometimes conflicts of uh, interest due to, to investor demands, but also, let's say, the strong uh, improvement of, of corporate governance, let's say, approach and attitude, and this was strongly supported by, by ELR uh, and other organizations. There was more and more also a trend now to appoint independent directors to, to uh, their, their board. Um, independent de directors uh, from, from different board members also meant in the last five to 10 years, this market really become an own, an own industry. You know, you saw more and more independent directors setting up their own single office or uh, director offices, offering the service as a real profession, as an added value for these independent directors. What I and we can see as of today is, um, most time it's more, um, 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 I, I always call it a hybrid model, where, where companies ask maybe their service provider, they look also maybe for independent directors, sometimes difficult to find them. What makes us um, really very happy and proud is that with our now um, platform we offer, um, where we have different independent directors on this platform, is an additional, let's say, searching tool uh, where then the fund initiators can, can um, look there or find their independent directors. And a lot of service companies like Arendt as law firm or, or PwC, Northern Trust, they now offer this platform also to their clients. And this, in my opinion, shows quite well that there is really a change in mindset and to, to really support this transformation to offer to the clients, to the industry also access to independent directors. So by summarizing, like, like Karen uh, mentioned before, I see there also an improvement of the selection process, of the composition process, but we are still currently in a transformation time and this needs some, some time still. Uh, I think that's a very important um, observation. I think that times are changing, uh, I think faster than ever before. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the COVID pandemic, which still isn't over, then the macroeconomic and geopolitical uh, difficulties, all the regulatory changes. Have you seen certain trends kind of growing or, or increasing attraction in the recent years? Or is it kind of very continuous, slow development? Definitely yes. And maybe my, my, um, the panelists can, can also share the view or uh, interesting to hear the view. But I have the impression COVID, like for a lot of other things, which are usually ESG related, and I agree, our function is G, or we are part of ESG. I think the COVID situation accelerated, you know? Fund initiators have now uh, realized that they do not only need people on the ground because to have substance and local know-how, it could also happen that borders are closed. And then traveling could be quite complex, and then they realize that it is really very important to have people on the ground. What I have seen is they want to have at least somebody from the region who can easily um, uh, travel to the office, um, but they also sometimes prefer, uh, prefer people domiciled in Luxembourg or having at least a professional address in Luxembourg. But summarizing, yes, indeed, it has an impact. Mm -hmm. If any of the other panelists have, have views or observations on that point, uh, feel free to, to add to that. I'll, I'll just share, share an experience, actually. One of my biggest clients 
UK based. Um, they were delighted to have somebody uh, on the ground to, to supervise their team um, during COVID. Not, and, I, and, and I went from independent, I, I still think of myself as independent, but I was far more often checking in on, on, on the team, making sure that they, they were okay. Um, and reassuring, having a reassuring, more experienced presence in Luxembourg on the ground where actually senior management are sitting in London. The, 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 all the, um, the bosses were sitting in London uh, and, and they felt very isolated and far away from their employees because they couldn't get on the plane anymore. And, and that model, um, I think, has kind of carried on a little bit in, in that example. For me, yeah. Thanks. Um, maybe moving on to the next question, so taking a more holistic view, we saw or heard about some individual impressions and perspectives, but uh, if we take a more holistic view of what the benefit generally for all stakeholders is across the board, um, I mean, Anka, what, uh, what would you highlight as the main benefits of appointing an independent director? Well, Thanks, first of all, for, uh, to Karen for already hi having highlighted quite a, quite a few of the points that, um, that I think I wanted to make. Um, I think, you know, hopefully I'm not going to bore everybody with, <laughs> with, the, with, the, um, with the comments, but um, I think um, what I did, I, I kind of entered the um, independent director uh, sphere or mandates um, in a special situation where one of my previous clients actually asked me if I wanted to join them for their um, for their funds and uh, become an, an independent director on their fund on their fund GPs, and uh, thereby replacing um, a director who had resigned, um, who was previously employed from the administrator side. So obviously the benefits were were obvious for that client, um, having someone coming in from the outside, um, as you also said. Um, not just to give an independent view on, um, on the various aspects of, of uh, managing and running a board of a fund, but also um, having knowledge of the, um, of the Luxembourg regulatory sphere, of um, how administrators operate, um, how the other different market participants operate. So um, being a Luxembourg market participant here, um, having administered funds for, for 15 years previously, um, that obviously seemed to be a benefit that the client was able to see. Um, and usually what you do see is, especially in the private equity field, is um, maybe not so much in, in the way that you, um, that you operate very much locally here. Um, GPs come from all over the place. So they come from the UK, from uh, Germany, uh, Netherlands, US. Um, and, and they don't know how Luxembourg works. Um, they don't know the market participants. So, and, and that is something that we can bring, uh, that, that I felt um, I was really helpful and I could bring value, value add to the client and to the promoter. Um, but not only to them, uh, guiding them th through the myriads of um, regulations and, and what, to, what to look for, but also working with the administrators um, you know, looking at the documents that they prepare, looking at the minutes, and, and looking at, at how the board is run. Um, I think from, from the various experiences that we can bring as an independent director, we can also probably um, guide the administrators, teams a little bit um, in, 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 doing, in doing better. And, and maybe what I can add to that is that um, often, head office, I mean, we recognise in Luxembourg that the head office is rarely here in Luxembourg. Often head office have this idea about regulation, this idea, AML is the, is the perfect example. Um, head office, they don't believe that Luxembourg requires all of this documentation. Oh my God, there's no way we're going to give that amount of information. It's ridiculous. Having an independent on, on the board to support the local team it, it really helps the local management to say, oh, no, well, why don't you ask Jane or Anka and, and, and see what they think? And, and then they brief us in advance so that we know, so that we can give the appropriate support. But I think it's really good 
also for local teams to have that support when they're r reporting to somewhere else in the world and, and they're being challenged a little bit. I think that's uh, also, you know, one of the big benefits of having somebody independent to that extra support. Yeah, right. And especially with, you know, obviously with my AML hat on, um, I, I kind of look at uh, what the administrator requires. You know, when, when you look at the TA um, bothering bothering um, the client with all those questions, um, getting the documents, etc. Um, I'm, I'm able to kind of bridge that that gap sometimes, the knowledge gap or um, the, the expectation gap, so to speak, between um, what the client wants to give or doesn't want to give and, and what the administrator needs in order to properly run uh, the, the onboarding process. I can just briefly confirm on that, even though we have a lot of substance in Luxembourg and we're big in Luxembourg, but I do have regular discussions with my colleagues in Switzerland who say, uh, can you, can't you just be a bit more pragmatic and then the independent can help. Uh, so especially when we have then a board dinner or something like that and we can talk about what do our competitors do, how are they positioned, do they really require all of that, is the board pack really 200 pages thick, can't we just trim it down um, and it helps. I can confirm that. And, and also, sorry, um, also and as working with so many different administrators, uh, well not so many but quite a few, um, you do see best practice. So do you do see you do see good board packs, um, large but not so good board packs. Um, and you can kind of differentiate and, and guide people. You know, you can. Um, it, it's that place I think where where we can add value to make things more efficient, um, to make them more logical, and and to um, to add to back best practice in the board. And that's what I meant in the beginning also, there was a change in mindset. So in the beginning when we had the first independent director, it was more like, oh, do we need to do that now from a regulatory perspective and where's the benefit? But over the course of the time you realize there is a benefit. But again, um, what we try to do when picking and selecting the board of the independent directors, we take them from maybe five or ten people we know because what we don't want to do is educate and train new independent directors every time, explaining them about our business case. So what's really helpful is if they know us, if they know our business setup, so that at least the discussions on the strategies are a bit easier. But then they can bring in their independent uh, in, uh, know-how. But and again, we want experience, so I don't want someone who's only in our company as independent. I really want them to be also in other companies, independent and proper companies. Uh, so where we say, okay, can we learn from, from their experience? Mm -hmm. um, maybe just switching from the, the benefits and advantages of having an independent director, what are, you know, from the perspective obviously of the independent director, what are the challenges that you face? Um, well, it's, it's, I may want to um, immediately follow on. Um, to what was just said, in terms of you know becoming uh, knowledgeable about a structure, uh, at the first instance when you first um, are contacted by a new client who you don't know, for example, um, who needs an independent director where you were referred, you don't know the company, uh, you don't know how how do they work, um, are they knowledgeable, do they know what they're doing, um, are they process-driven, are they a process-driven GPs, for example? Who are the other service providers that they have engaged? You don't know them. You don't know the team that you're going to be working with. Are they um, knowledgeable? Do they know the asset class? Um, um, have you worked with them before? So, so how, um, how much hands-on do you have to be in your role as an independent director? How much of a guidance do you need to bring? So. All of these are, are questions that you cannot answer in, in the beginning. Um, so once you, you find um, this client is interesting to work with, you like them, you know, you, you're on the same wavelength, so to speak. Um, they think that you can complement the board with your skill set. Uh, but then really the challenges come um, when it comes to the day-to-day -day operations and, and running it and finding the role, how hands-on it has to be. And, I mean, interestingly, I think that recruiting an independent director should be uh, possibly even a more rigorous process than recruiting uh, a member of senior management because uh, 
having a half... I mean, some independent directors are recruited in a a half-hour, maybe an hour call. Um, uh, Let's have a little exchange of niceties about the weather for 15 minutes, and then you present your your CV and they present the project and then they say, here, here you, we'll give you 20000 for it and this deal done. Um, that, I think, is not very reassuring. Certainly not very reassuring for me. I mean, one of my, one of my clients, I had seven interviews with numerous mem- members of uh, senior staff. At the beginning, I actually didn't really want the client. After seven interviews... I thought, well, actually, I've learned so much about the organisation and the people there that it was actually a worthwhile investment of time and they offered me the job, so, so great. But I think that process of sharing knowledge, even before you appoint the board member, it, it gives them the opportunity really to think, um, are we really matched? So maybe there's somewhere in between one one interview for half an hour and, and seven one plus hours of interviews but but I think in that process of recruiting I think there should be time spent um, explaining you know the challenges of the organization so the director can also decide can they contribute to this this business am, am, am I the right profile for this kind of company to make the right contribution so if you allow me to add maybe I think very challenging is to have the sufficient number of mandates allowing you to be independent from a financial point of view. Independent uh, in mind, absolutely it must be, but you must also be financially um, independent. This does not mean that you are rich, but you must have a sufficient number of, of clients allowing you also to say, no, I disagree and I will terminate. This is, I think, especially for for joiners, the biggest challenge. And so we heard about diligencing, we heard about interview process, we heard about uh, financial parameters. Are there any other pointers you would give to make sure that the relationship is off to a good start and is really kind of the most fertile ground for a productive uh, collaboration over the years? I, I would like to say that um, the organisation, they, they need to be very clear what they want from their director, from their independent director. Um, we're in Luxembourg, we're LPEA, there are a lot of SPVs in this world, in our Luxembourg world, and there are a lot of non-executive directors, increasing numbers of non-executive directors sitting on the boards of SPVs. What do we want from the directors who sit on the board of those SPVs? Um, do we, do, do you as a client, um, I'm probably going a little bit too far, but do you as, a, 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 as an organization, do you want somebody who's just gonna sign? Um, I, that doesn't quite exist anymore, but how much time do you want to spend with that director? You need to be clear. Do I want you as an advisor? Do I want an independent director who's going to accompany me through the new structures, maybe a tax expert who can challenge my tax structuring? Do I want that kind of person? Or do I kind of want the basic service? It's still That's still okay to want the basic service, and the director comes, you give them the information that they need so they can write the answer, ask the right questions and sign or, or whatever. Um, or do I want more? And I, I personally think it's important to be clear with, uh, as, as the engager of the independent director, it's important to be clear with them what you want so they can give you what, they, what, you, what you want. And... Um, uh, and that you're very clear in your mind, because I, I, I have clients which are a bit of both, but I, and, and the ones that don't want me to accompany them, they find it extremely irritating when I make um, suggestions to change things or, or do this kind of stuff, they actually get a little bit annoyed with me. And on, on the flip side, those that really want me to do that, maybe I'm not doing enough of it. So, so I think it needs to be clear. What do you want from your independent director? Whilst keeping it in the frame of, uh, we, we are signing, we do have certain responsibilities, so we have to have enough information to be able to sign, of course. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, another aspect, maybe, uh, 
communication flow. So, you know, um, a board is always, I think it always should be run as a people business. So it needs to have uh, good communication between all parties and we need to make sure that the independent director is not left outside. You speak to the administrator, agree something, how things are done, and then the, the director comes to sign, um, which is obviously something that you've just explained. But um, uh, having a good understanding of the roles, of the limitations, um, and of the expectations is key. And maybe turning that around for maybe for, for Thomas and Edward, the, the other view. I mean, so we've heard what, you know, ideally you'd be looking for uh, from an independent director view, but from a kind of sponsor and, and uh, initiative point of view, do you perfectly align with that expectation or would you have additional things you would be looking for uh, when selecting uh, independent directors and constructing kind of the board for a given company? The diversity is important and not in terms of gender, but really bringing in uh, different experience. And that's what I said, we really, uh, keen to understand how the independent director sees his, in the other mandates, what he sees from the market. We really also expect from an independent director that he uh, reads the regulation, that he understands the, the new regulation that is coming up, how that is interpreted on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I don't want is an independent director coming into a board meeting, not having read anything and signing. Uh, so uh, I, I usually what we try to do is also have a call before the board meeting, um, going through questions so that the board meeting doesn't take five hours, um, but also to give a certain security safety for the independent director and also for us, what are the topics that need, do we need to deal with, what are the decisions that we want to take jointly, and as I said, I, it's, it's a partnership. I mean, you're running a company together and you're supervising a company. So it's, I, I don't want anyone just sitting there next to me and it's like, here, sign here. Yeah, so that's also important for us. And that's why I'm saying we're not just picking, we're, we don't have just 10 or 20 independent directors where we're picking from a couple of people where we know where we have that trust. Would be an expensive pen to have sitting next to you. <laughs> well, but then at least the governance is done. I think there is nothing I, I, I can add. It's all said, but maybe, um, you know, these are the companies who, are, who agree that it makes sense and they are looking. But I disagree with Jane. I think there are unfortunately still some companies out there who still prefer to do their own decision, have group thinking, um, and if they have to hire an independent director, they prefer to apply the all boy network um, approach. But, thanks God, it's an improving uh, development we can see. And then I can only share the, the comments uh, mentioned before. Great. Um, looking at my watch, we are already a little bit over time compared to the um, to initial planning, which I think is is evidence of, you know, there's so much knowledge being or being uh, in the room and, and so much insight that can be shared. Nonetheless, before we go to the uh, networking part of, of today's session, I would want to open it up uh, to the audience if there are any questions for our panelists. Uh, I think we have microphones that normally should be going around if you do have questions. So if there are any that you'd like to raise now, uh, please feel free to, to raise your hand. I see one there. The mic is on its way. Uh, would you see it to be good governance practice to, uh, for board members to be assigned specific areas of responsibility? similar to what is expected from conducting officers? Is there one specifically that you would like to address the question to, or is that just anyone that, that would like to? Uh, anyone. Anyone. Uh, I, on many of my boards, I am not assigned the responsibility of ESG, but I have been recruited because uh, I've got a lot of sustainable finance knowledge. So. That doesn't mean to say I have the responsibility. Um, and actually, I consider it my responsibility to make sure that the others really understand 
uh, the sustainability challenges, you know, the, the, the responsibilities that they have for mis-selling products if we say it's ESG and it's not, and that kind of thing. Um, my personal view on your question is that on most topics, like what Karen said, everybody has to have a certain level of knowledge. You don't have to be an expert, and I don't expect my fellow board members to be experts on ESG like I am. Um, but I still have an important role to make sure that they understand the importance of the decisions that we're making and why we are making them, and to, to help progress. So then you need to have a minimum level of understanding. You need to, I think, when you're on a board, you need to understand, um, uh, you need to understand basic financials and how, uh, how financial accounting works, same as you need to understand some of the basic regulations. Uh, without being an AML expert, you still need to understand the importance of all of these things. I don't know if everybody else has any views. Huh? Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. Um, I've probably also been hired on, on the mandates uh, because of the expertise in, I bring in AML and administration. Uh, but then uh, having a rigid uh, set of roles for each of the board members, I think, would go too far um, because that uh, takes away the ability um, of the board to be diverse um, and maybe even have emphasis here and there, which, which naturally, I think, kind of evens out anyway um, in discussion uh, throughout the boards. So rigid roles, no, but um, a soft um, kind of making sure that there is a good balance, yes. Which I think also goes to the complementary approach we heard about when thinking about the collective um, knowledge and collective skill set of a board. So I think that makes perfect sense. And, and uh, I mean, many boards, I wouldn't say most boards, but many boards do a self-evaluation process and they have a skills matrix and they list, you know, these are the skills that we need on our board and from all of the directors who, how do you consider your own knowledge in the specific areas and, 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 and you, that helps to identify those areas where we've got enough knowledge but also those areas where we don't have enough knowledge um, to kind of build up build up the right composition. Any other questions? I think I saw a hand over there. So I have just one question for the independent uh, directors. So during the career recruitment phase, and uh, you have uh, like, uh, an interview and do you ask your clients if uh, they can provide the AML compliance documents before you accept the mandate? So, I mean, um, all the clients are not coming 100% uh, from uh, auditors or from big fours or lawyers. So you don't know if the uh, compliance work was done. So what are your requirements during this phase? Well, maybe I can start answering that. Well, usually you, I am referred by someone um, who knows me and by someone who knows the client and who is also a service provider to the client or a lawyer to the client. Um, or another client refers me to the new client. Um, so in terms of AML from my side, I don't do it on the client, I, yes, I do do some desktop research on who they are and what they do, um, but I don't run a sanction screening on them, if you may. Um, although we will be required, uh, due to new regulation that's out with the service providers uh, regulation that we, we need to kind of register, we also need to fulfill AML requirements now as an independent director, um, but I prefer to do this once everything is clear. Um, because the, the job of doing AML on someone is quite large. And um, as usually your, um, your possibility to put down a mandate and reject a mandate are quite flexible as an independent director anyway. So if something comes up during that process of um, you know, looking behind the scenes a little bit, um, then there's always that possibility. Obviously, you've never had that problem so far, so thanks God, thank God. 
Well, I'm an ex-auditor and, and anybody who works with auditors know that the auditors ask lots and lots of details. So um, I have to admit that I in, have highly inspired myself from my auditor background when I'm doing my client acceptance. Um, so I do actually ask quite a lot of information. Um, maybe not quite as much as the auditors do, but uh, still a fair amount before I sign the contract. Maybe answering as an independent director, yes, I run an AML. I also run via Worldcheck, LexisNexis. But to be honest, this is only doable because I can use my platform from the independent director side where we all member screen. So otherwise, for sure, it would be challenging, maybe via Google, doing your own research, yeah. Especially for smaller initiators. And, yeah, yeah and, and, and well, well, these systems, I'm me on my own, on my so, so I have to admit, I don't run WellCheck or any of those kind of, because uh, I don't have access to the system. Um, I do yeah, Google, which uh, I guess it's best effort, but um, yeah. Yeah, well, just I actually have now um, f felt that I needed to um, go onto LexisNexis as well. So, um, so I do the sanction, sanction screening and, and world check screening, but after the fact, usually once um, once I've started, signed on the dotted line. Thank you. Any further questions that you'd want to raise now? Otherwise, obviously, you always uh, have the opportunity during the, the networking cocktail um, if there are any questions. I don't see any further hands, so I think uh, with that, we can probably close the session. Uh, I would like to thank my esteemed panel for their contribution today. Um, obviously, Karen and uh, Stefan as well. Um, I think it was a very uh, insightful, very practical session. So thank you very much for your time. And obviously, thank you to all of you for coming as well. And please now enjoy the, uh, the cocktail that will be served next door. Thank you very much. Thanks.